Obama giving a shout out to something else. Something else, Daddy. This is Nicole Vitale, Great Warrior Wolf, and you are listening to Something Else. I'm Tony Cheney, and you're listening to Something Else. Hey everybody, it's Rich Palladino, the voice of New England, and you are listening to Something Else with Aria. <laughs> episode number 103 of something else it is wednesday so that means only one thing it's time for some nwa total non-stop action and joining me as she does every wednesday on this fine radio program is the don west to my mike today it's cindy cindy how you doing today I don't have the energy to do my Don West voice, but be darned, people! We got some Jed Mid 10 action for you. And since you know I'm at Shop at Home Network, you know I'm lying through my teeth. You're not finding that Griffey rookie card in all of that junk wax that you bought from us. Jim, Mc- Jim Mint 10 Derek Sheeter rookie cards, damn it. That's what we all need. So. TNA, we not only got through one episode, we only got through two episodes. We're not getting through number three. And man, oh man, <laughs> these shows, um, they could be better. Um, certainly can't get much worse. Oh, they will. <laughs> oh, trust me. Yeah. Next week. I, I'm, I've watched, uh, I've only well, rewatched, I watched. I think we mentioned this before. The first time I tried watching these episodes, I made it a year up to the point when Disco Inferno becomes top heel and world title challenger. <laughs> and I, like, honestly, the way these are going, like, Jesus Christ, I'm shocked I haven't already quit. Because I've made it through six episodes and oh my God. Like, I, I guess spoiler for future weeks, what kept me going in the early episodes was the X Division. And the problem is, <laughs> even in 2012, watching this stuff from 2002 was great and you know, still innovative to a point. Nowadays, it's like, I, I hate to say this, you know, it's passe compared, you know, in a lot of ways to the athleticism, if nothing else, um, <clears throat> of 2024 wrestling. Mm-hmm. And so it takes the one thing that I found enjoyable, enjoyable about it away um, because there's a lot of crap on these shows coming up. Oh, yeah. And it's like, there's shit that it's like, how on earth? Because I like, I don't even know how the hell Jerry Jarrett allowed it. Because, yeah, we'll get to the issues they have. And some of it was Russo getting shit in unchecked. Um, because, you know, it's supposed to be uh, Russo's ideas, Jerry Jarrett editing them to make sense into whatever becomes TNA. And... Unfortunately, there are times where shit just goes through without Jerry's approval, allegedly. Uh, if Jerry Jarrett was the filter for these first shows that we've watched right now, I am also low-key grateful he did not take over in 1994 for, for Vince if he was found guilty. I mean, in his book, he claims he was, that he was uh, rewriting all the formats and all the scripts, and it, I don't know, you know, I'd like to think that he wouldn't be taking credit for something so awful if it wasn't his idea. Maybe it's his southern charm, I guess. Let's just get to it. All right, so it's NWA Total Nonstop Action number three. July 3rd, 2002, from the Municipal Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. It is the location, well, it was. it's the city of the next 108 pay-per-views, Nashville, Tennessee. Now, the next three weeks, they're in the Municipal Auditorium, which is the big building in Nashville. Um, but then Jeff and Jerry Jarrett 
quickly smarten up and realize that they could not come close to filling such a large building. So from week six on, they would be at the Nashville Fairgrounds. Now, the big draw to this week's show is we're going to crown new NWA Tag Team Champions in a one-night four-team tournament. And also, Ken Shamrock and AJ Styles will defend their respective championships. And I note that the crowd is hot for the Open, and we'll see if they stay that way. Yeah, you also have the matches. Well, Ken Shamrock versus Malice, that was set up last week. Mm -hmm. And how did David Young get a title shot? What did Bobcat do backstage? Uh, Who's in charge this week? Uh, Jim Miller? So maybe uh, Bobcat... uh... Winked at him. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more. Yes. Now, I'll say this, and the production sucks here as well, and we'll get to it. Even with a large building, I thought there, it looked like a lot of people were there. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it was just the way it was shot, but, and that was one of the things TNA always did really well, was they made uh, sometimes empty buildings look a lot fuller than it was. Mm -hmm. Which was actually a WCW thing. You know, even when they were dying, if you go back and look at, you know, crowd shots, it's like, wow, this looks like a fucking, you know, full ass arena. And you find out there's 3000 people there. It remind I have a, a friend who went to the second to last Nitro and the last Thunder. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you take a look just on TV, there's only like normally when you see uh, the entrance way, there's like about eight to ten rows. There were only like three in those last Nitros and Thunders. Interesting. Okay. So apparently we have an exception. Three rows. Damn. But it was the second to last show. Yeah. And it was dead, so. Spoiler alert, WCW dies. (laughs) Now, I know that there was a lot of pyro on this show. And to me, that shows that they've already gotten the false information about their buy rates from their pay-per-view guy, and yep. they're starting to dangerously overspend. And uh, that brings us actually to the open of the show, where Mike Tanay introduces a very sweaty man whose name is allegedly Jim Miller, and he's the president of the NWA. I say allegedly because the graphic lists him as Jim Wilson. Welcome to TNA. Mr. Wilson, thanks for the trophy. He gives him a giant ass trophy for some reason. And then he announces that he has found a Japanese wrestler named Amori, who will be here next week to challenge for the NWA world title. You also forget about the main event of the show being Jared and K-Crush versus Brian Christopher and Scott Hall. That is the main event. Uh, Scott Hall and Brian Waller or Brian Christopher or whatever the hell he's being called this week versus K Crush and Scott Hall. So, I mean, in theory, you know, I mean, it helps they didn't really announce much of anything, but in theory, it sounds like a deep card. We're going to have a tag team title tournament. We're going to have AJ Styles defending the X Division title. We're going to have a world title match. And then we have four of our big names in a tag team main event. Yep. It sounds pretty stacked. But then you break it down as we start with our first match, and you realize not really. Chris Harris and James Storm versus the Johnsons with Mortimer Plumtree in a first-round tag team title match. Um, Last week, Harris and Storm were told to take their shirts off and go wrestle the gay team because the redneck hillbilly team hates gay people. So the team that would become America's Most Wanted had their first two matches against the gay team and the penises. Uh, Mortimer cuts a pre-match promo, and I know he has a really good delivery. Yeah. Um, I think what he was in the same uh, NWA territory. I think it was like Anarchy, um, where Styles was, and a lot of the guys that you would come to see in the X Division came up in. Maybe wild side. Yeah. Um, So, by the way, the Johnsons without their masks were the Shane twins. 
who were actually the NWA tag team champions until TNA became a thing. So, I I guess in a way it's to keep, well, I say to keep the titles linear, but we're going to find out that doesn't even matter anyway. But uh, Harris punches one of them in the head, hits a Thez press. I don't know which is worse, punching the Johnson in the head or giving him the Thez press. Um, Um, Equally bad. Uh, By the way, uh, wanted to circle back. Mortimer Plumtree has a cricket bat. Um, I'd like to say he is 22 years ahead of his time now. Indeed, uh, that uh, that that uh, is a <coughs> yeah, folks. When you're listening to this, three weeks ago there was the was it the cricket World Cup or is it some sort of cricket tournament that yeah. U.S. is doing well in ish. Um. So let's see here. Uh, ha- uh, they get the heat on Storm. Harris yells encouragement, which consists of get out of the corner. Um, Storm hits a super kick, makes a hot tag, uh, and breaks down to a four-way. And Harris gets a victory on one of the Johnsons after he catches Harris on a crossbody. And Storm hits Harris in the back with a missile drop kick. Um, and so Harris lands on top of him for the win. Um after the match, Mortimer shoved the Johnsons, so they shoved him down and walked off. And I believe, and I believe I am correct, that this is the end of the Johnsons. Yep, they are done. A um, couple of lines that I had written down here, uh, one of them from Ed Ferrara. They're six foot two, seven foot one if they're glad to see you. Um, let me check. They're, for me, they're actually, oh, they're six feet under. Perfect. They're dead? No. Um inverted. Oh. Oh, okay. Um yeah, they paint yeah, at the end of the match they choke plum tree, leave him limp. And he's crying and saying, We can still be friends. We can be friends. Which of course they were never friends. No. In first place. No. Uh, and it's hilarious because in 2002, they were really counting on the Johnsons as one of those gimmicks of like, hey, this is going to make TNA. Is Look at this great, awesome idea we have for a gimmick. Two men dressed like penises. And they're gone in three weeks. And like they're native to Florida. So it's not like, oh, well, you know, they're from California. So we're cutting costs and not going to fly in people from across the country. No, no, they could have fucking driven if they really wanted to up to uh, Nashville for the shows. Um, but nope, no more Johnsons. The next time we see them on national television, they are managed by Simon Dean as the Gemini. A much better gimmick. They still never uh, like. I think they got less of a push in WWE than they did in TNA. They had two matches. I think the gym and I had about five or six. I, I, I was at the show they debuted, and I don't remember them doing anything else ever. Like, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm not, I'm sure you're not <laughs> lying. I'm sure they had five or six matches. I just, you know, don't remember them at all. Probably velocity. Probably. Uh, by the way, I gave that match a 3.0 out of 10. I kind of liked it more than you did. You know, the whole show to me felt like a rush Saturday night taping. And I'll be honest, I mean, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, if you're going to compare it to Saturday night, I mean, it's not a bad thing if you're comparing it to the good Saturday night, the Saturday night everybody remembers. If you're comparing it to 1999, where the shows were 99% uh, natural born, well, the future natural born thrillers. Um, that's, you know, something else. We'll talk more about that because I really want to dive into Saturday Night 99 and 2000. Okay. Um, four Ash is in the ring and he introduces... Uh, by the way, five out of ten. Oh, okay. Yeah, you really like that more than I did. Yeah. Uh, four Ash introduces Scott Hall, who, like we mentioned earlier, will team with Brian Christopher against Jared and Cake Rush. He gets out of Hey Yo when Jared interrupts. 
Jared tells him to take his ass where he came from, bitch. Those are strong words. So Hall challenges Jared to get his ass in the ring. Jared charges the ring, but is told to stop by either Jim Miller or Jim Wilson. Uh, Jim told him to leave or listen. Jarrett was nice enough to leave and wait for the main event. Wilson told him he'll take Hall when they tell him they'll take him. Crush runs in from the crowd to attack Hall, and Hall had zero problem with K-Crush, dropping him with the sack of shit slam and giving him a clothesline out of the ring. Nice to know that you're uh, also, you also listen to Marky D, because I had in my notes, Scott Hall comes to cut a, come to the ring and cut a promo, or he would, but a wild slap nuts appears and calls Scott Hall a bitch. Timeless. Uh, in the back, Goldilocks is standing around, and Chris Harris and James Storm have been savagely beaten down and are wearing the crimson mask. They literally were in the ring like four minutes ago, and they go to the back, and they have already gotten their ass kicked so badly that they are left unconscious and bloody. And Goldilocks had time to find them. And the since, pacing is horrendous. And, and since Goldilocks, you know, she didn't come upon them while the ass kicking was taking place. The ass kicking was so fast that one of the, in theory, two best tag teams in the company got their asses kicked so quickly and decisively that who the mystery attackers were able to quickly run away. So Goldilocks could walk in and discover them and go drag a cameraman with her to report on this. Another thing we need to bring up. Um, you are watching this on TNA Plus. I'm watching the live pay-per-view edits. Um, Did I do, miss you have, do you have the cage dancers with a little scroll on the bottom? I'm sure I did. I just stopped, you know, noting every time. But don't you do the scroll of, like, where all the NWA shows are going to be in the next few weeks or whatever? Yep, that's what they do. And I find it hilarious that if you want to check out the NWA, you have to pay $10 to see the show. You get this little blurb about where the NWA is going to be, um, knowing that none of the people on TNA are going to be there, especially... ECC, NWA ECCW, which is Vancouver, British Columbia. Okay, that that's that I believe would be true. But like I could see, you know, especially in theory, this is supposed to be the big, the biggest of the NWA territories at this point. So it's like I could see like the in the smaller promotions being like, hey, these guys maybe like I'm not going to bring in Jeff Jarrett because that's going to cost a bit more money. But hey, Harris and Storm have now television or pay-per-view credibility we can bring them in and it might increase the audience a little bit so i could see where it might help to bring these people in Mm -hmm. um now i didn't note this time but like i'm mentioning this from like future episodes i've watched maybe it's because i'm now old i'm almost 40 and i get that's not really old but that scroll was going by so quickly that like i couldn't pay attention enough to see what the hell it was saying half the time. I knew what it was, but I couldn't pay attention to what the hell it was actually saying. There are only two territories that scrolled each time when they had the cage dancers. Okay. Maybe those were the only uh, territories that had shows that week. Because that was actually part of the contract with TNA and the NWA was they had to promote the other NWA shows, and that was actually part of what led to the falling out of NWA and TNA. Well, one of many things that led to the falling out. Suddenly, Abyss's music starts playing, and in a segment right after Goldilocks, because, spoiler alert, you know, Goldilocks... Actually, she doesn't bring Abyss in. Goldilocks, though, does manage Abyss, I think. Yeah. Um, But anyway, Abyss's music plays, and out comes the alpha male Monty Brown. And I note that, you know, I I honestly forgot that he was here this early. Like I, and, you know, according to his book, uh, Jerry said he would have loved to keep Monty in the early days, but he wanted more money than Jerry felt that he was worth 
considering Monty's experience level at the time. Um, and he says he he cuts a promo saying he came to TNA for Ken Shamrock, which, you know, is fine. And he can see the charisma that, of course, we'd all know him for. Mm-hmm. Um, although the promo, the promo ability, and it's funny because his promos were never that great if you actually listen to them, but he hasn't yet developed the distinct style that Monty Brown was known and sometimes loved for. Right. Um, um, mm-hmm. Going back to the music, they kind of kill the song. They had the lyrics in it? Yeah. yeah it, it was a business theme with the whatever lyrics were in it. Um, but I'll tell you what, that's definitely improvement of some of the fucking songs we've had on this show. So, mm-hmm. There is that. By the way, his opponent is Anthony Ingram. If you don't know who he is, don't worry, because nobody else does either. Um, Ingram goes for a splash in the corner, but Brown catches him and hits a power slam and then wins with the Alpha Bomb. It's 2002, so you just add your name to the word bomb, and that is your finish. Um, I For a squash match, I must have liked this, because I gave it a 1.5. I gave it a 2. Goldie oh, Locks. can we? We need to talk about this promo. Goldie Locks is backstage talking with random security people, and she cannot find Jim Miller. It's been three minutes for the love of Christ. Goldie she also runs into the hot shots as well. We'll talk about them next week. I, I note that she runs into two guys with hot shots on their asses who had no idea where Jim was. And by the way, I like, I don't know. I, I guess I'm going to spoil things for you. It's the hot shots that took out AMW. But I don't know if that was the actual plan, but I thought this was a cute little uh, note if you're really paying attention. Because, hey, look at this. The hot shots just happened to be where Goldilocks is, who minutes ago just discovered the bloodied Harrison Storm. <laughs> uh Puppet the Psycho Dwarf came in saying, and again, it's 2002, this is the accepted vernacular, and I am just quoting him. Puppet the Psycho Dwarf comes in and says he wanted to beat some midget ass tonight and make them bleed. And he started to run down all of these famous little people right now, uh, at the time. Uh, Gary Coleman, Beetlejuice, Vern Troyer, Mini-Me... And um, it reminded me of a promo that he cut. Um, I don't know if you remember the show, WWA Rev- Revolution. World Wrestling All-Stars. Yep. Around the, the, the same cadence, the same promo. Um, it worked, I guess. But the mm-hmm. WWE... If you wanted to know what the WW what TNA was before TNA, the WWA is not a bad uh, comparison. Pretty much, because if you watch the WWA shows, like, well, first of all, they were fucking atrocious, but by and large, you had a lot of the people who made up the TNA roster, especially the early TNA roster. Yep. Um, and then the WWA last show that they do in May of 2003, it was essentially the WWA TNA merger as they merged the WWA belts with the TNA belts. And spoiler alert, the WWA champions all lost. Okay, so uh, time for our second tournament match, the Rainbow Express with Joel Gertner versus Buff Bagwell and a hollow so the two teams in the first match qualified because they won their matches on the prior two shows these two teams one of them is zero and one and the other one had never teamed before and we talked about this last week i think it was where you were asking who the fourth team was and i'm like i'm not gonna tell you but you know you'll never guess it yeah um before the match, Buff Bagwell cut a promo was like, hey, rookie, you're number two, I'm number one. You follow me, I'm number one, you're number two. You know, I, God. 
Apollo looked surprised at being considered the second best wrestler behind Buff Bagwell, but uh, they did vow to become the tag team champions. Um, so Don West continues to be disgusted by Lenny and Bruce, who patted each other on the ass as the match started. Uh, Bagwell gets in a couple offensive moves on Bruce, but instead of continuing on, he begins showboating and gets cut off. Alicia makes her weekly appearance walking to ringside. And this week, it's Ed Ferrara who gave her money. Um, but he says that this is not what we are thinking it is. So it, it is not prostitution. Apollo tags in and they run wild uh, while we watched Alicia get the money from Ferrara. Joel distracts Apollo, which allows Lenny and Bruce to take over. The Express kissed in and out, and they hit the Haas and Benjamin double team where one leapfrogs over the other, which will be the only time in the I will ever compare the Rainbow Express to Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin. And the funny thing is, this is before Haas and Benjamin become a team, so technically, Haas and Benjamin stole that from the Rainbow Express. Nah, I've, I've seen the Midnight Express do that move also, so... I would rather think that they stole it from Lenny and Bruce than Bob Eaton and Stan Lane. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, let's see here. So Paul, they get the heat on Apollo. Apollo, may, uh, he makes his own comeback, but then makes the cold tag to Bagwell. Bagwell runs wild and then falls up <laughs> with Lenny. Uh, he was trying to do a crossbody, but they just couldn't time it right, so they just fell out of the ring. Apollo super kicked Bruce in the ring and hit the TKO, but Lenny attacked from behind. Apollo sent was sent outside as Bagwell hits the blockbuster. Instead of making the cover, Bagwell celebrates, and he eats a super kick for the pin. So the Rainbow Express win and advance over Apollo and Bagwell. Um, after the match, he announces Rip on Bagwell for showboating after every move. Ed Ferrara goes and interviews Buff, who says he is not Buff, but he is Marcus. So I am not a muscle. I am a man. His name is Marcus Bagwell, folks. Um, and this, this was shit. And it's the end of Buff and TNA. Oh, <laughs> that's right. He's done after this. Yes. Uh, and by the way, I don't just mean it's the end of Buff because he's coming back as Marcus Bagwell. No, no. It's the end of Marcus Bagwell in TNA. Funny thing is, uh, well, I mean, I say the match was fine for what it was and they gave it a 2.5. But, you know, yeah, it, it was the weaker of the two first round matches. I'll also add that we will see Buff again in TNA, but not in a wrestling capacity. He will be part of the uh, tease of 2006 of who is Sting's partner in a tag team who would wind up being Samoa Joe. I was going to say, I'm not sure if you're going to say it or not, but like, you know, even if we do reach that point and we watch the shows past the weekly pay-per-view era, um, you know, by that point, it's, uh, Whatchamacallit, uh, people may have forgotten who we're talking about. If we yeah. say uh, what did you give uh, that as a rating? A one. Okay. So we pretty much evened it out here. You know? Yeah. We pretty much agreed on the Monty Brown match. You liked the first a lot more, and I apparently liked the second match more. Like, yeah. Shockingly. The World Heavyweight Champion has decided now after. Three matches, a promo segment, and a bunch of miscellaneous angles backstage that it is time to make an appearance. Ken Shamrock wanders out to the stage and says he is confused about what is going on. He rips on Monty Brown for wanting a title shot, saying to watch what he wishes for. He puts down the quote-unquote Japanese punk he has to wrestle next week and said he would be happy to shove Monty's head up his ass instead of, you know, Amore's head up his ass. The lights go out, and we are magically whisked away to section C2, where Jim Mitchell is standing there, telling Shamrock not to worry about Monty Brown or Amore, but to fear Malice. The lights go up, and Malice is standing above Shamrock's fallen body, so now we have two injury angles on the same show. Oh, 
and the cosmic ballet goes on, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Russo's writing the show, so I guess I should be happy we haven't had five injury angles on the same show already. They did this injury, multiple injury angle at the same time. Remember in WCW 99 when Luger was, like, breaking everybody's forearms? Yep. And, like, half the roster had casts? Yep. So are you thinking this is going to lead to a lumberjack match for everybody who's been injured this week or as a cast? No. Okay. Not enough forethought. <laughs> and plus half of those people would be gone anyways because of budget cuts. And, and it's funny because that was a Kevin Sullivan angle. because That was after Russo got fired the first time. Wow. Yeah. So so maybe, we're, yeah, maybe we're wrong. Maybe these are all great angles because the, you know, great bookers like Jerry Jarrett and Kevin and yeah, yeah, Kevin Sullivan uh, think about them. Um, Goldilocks is continuing to wander around backstage and, has run, and runs across Jerry Lynn asking Bill Behrens to replace Harris and Storm in the tag team title tournament. Bill blows him off and Jerry Lynn just walks away. So, and I mean, you might ask yourself, you know, does Jerry Lynn have a tag team partner? That's not the point. The, the point is, you know, you don't need a tag team partner to qualify for the tag team title tournament. We've seen that already. Yeah, look at Bagwell and Apollo. Yes. There had to have been another team. because, Like, we had so many goddamn tag team matches already. Who, the, well, the Dups. Like, why weren't the Dups in the tournament? They forfeited their, apparently they forfeited their spot because they wouldn't wrestle the Rainbow Express last week. True, because who would they have had to wrestle this week? Uh, the Rainbow Express again. Yeah. Um, all right. Or he could have switched it to the Rainbow Express versus the Johnsons. That could have been interesting. And then Harrison Storm versus the Dups. That's two on the nose. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, Puppet the Psycho Dwarf versus Todd Stone. As I've mentioned already in pro wrestling parlance, Little People Wrestling was referred to as midget wrestling for decades. In more recent days, it has been changed to more politically correct terminology. I feel like I have to say that because if I don't, somebody will listen to the show for the first time ever and hear me say midget. And, you know, the 12 people who listen to the show will be really angry at me. Todd Stone, I, I, I guess, you know, complaint, one complaint after another here. Todd Stone looks like a two-legged Zach Gowan. And... I think, Yikes. Yeah. I think he may weigh more than Gowan. Uh, anyway, Puppet beats on him with a kendo stick and a trash can. The humor, of course, is that Puppet hates midgets despite being one himself and is facing a little person who's actually taller than him. Uh, Puppet puts a trash can over him and picks up the win with a TKO on the trash can. Okay. Um, after the match, Puppet hit both Slick Johnson and Jeremy Borash with a kendo stick before going outside the ring and hitting Don West with it. Don he was congratulating him, but he said the magic word. Which was? Little. If nothing else, the crowd was into this. Um, that I So Puppet wins, I give it a 1.0 out of 10. Yeah, uh, I had a two, but my feeling is now more like a 1.5. Goldilocks, who has now been on the show about 15 times, is interviewing the EMTs who are dealing with Ken Shamrock, and they don't know if Shamrock will be able to wrestle tonight or not. And they, it, we, we now get a non-title match. A non-title match. Now, I laugh, and you're thinking, okay, we, we have two champions of TNA. We have Ken Shamrock. We just noted it. He's injured. He's supposed to wrestle Malice later, but he's injured. So, you know, well, m it's probably not him. And we mentioned AJ Styles is going to wrestle. He's the X Division champion. Maybe Ari and uh, Cindy misspoke. Maybe it's a non-title match he has. No. No. No, no, no. The non-title match we're going to have is Miss TNA Taylor Vaughn 
versus Francine. I legit didn't think Francine ever came back after last week. Told you she came back for a couple times. Uh, Francine takes off a belt that was wrapped around her boot and beats Taylor with it before the match. Taylor then stood up, completely no-selling it, took the belt from referee Scott Armstrong and beat Francine with it. Scott tries to do his job, but Taylor hits him with the belt. And then despite the belt never ringing to start the match, Scott disqualified Taylor Vaughn. Blame Tiny for not ringing the bell the first time. After the match, Ed Ferrara raises Francine's hand and grabbed her boob, so Francine beat him with the belt. Again. He did, he, they did this last week. So I, I've got an important question to ask. Since she now has a non-title win, does this mean Francine is going to be getting a title match? Um, She could. Now, I try to give every match at least a 0.1. However, some matches don't even deserve that. Zero. I, I, it was, wasn't a match. I'm convinced it wasn't a match. Well, the bell rang at least once, and there was a winner declared. So Call it a mistake and move on. We are 53 minutes into the show at this point. 53 minutes! And we've had five matches and a shitload of angles, most of which I have already forgotten. And then it's time for more angles. Jeremy Borash introduces Hermie Sadler, who keeps showing up for some reason. Hermie thanks the fans for supporting NASCAR, which, of course, that's what we want here in our wrestling show. This brings out K-Crush, who thankfully already has new music. He tells Hermie to shut the fuck up. He doesn't quite say that, but, you know, the, the intention is there. He tells Hermie none of these idiot fans like NASCAR. So Hermie tackles one of the top two heels in the company, top, maybe top three if he could malice. He tackles one of the top heels in the company to the mat and then needed to be held back by his pit crew from kicking his ass. And then Crush got held back from by security. And they said that next week it is him versus Hermie Sadler. In a match that really happens. What did both of us think of the match? Find out next week. The results are going to surprise you. I don't know if the results will, will surprise you or not. I mean, I, well, I, I'm trying to get people to listen to the next show. We're doing a better job of hyping up the next show than TNA are. Very true. Yeah. You know? Although I'd like to think if we had our truth versus Hermie Sadler on our show in 2024, it would mean a lot more than it did for TNA. Okay, so 15 minutes ago, Malice... You might get some promotion on the hub, on the, the NASCAR race hub, but they just canceled that. I was going to say on the bump, but I think they canceled that too. That's because we need more first things first on Fox Sports 1. <laughs> so 15 minutes ago, Malice beat up Ken Shamrock so badly that he was carried off in a neck brace. Eight minutes ago, it was doubtful he could wrestle. Well... Our next match is NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ken Shamrock versus Malice with Jim Mitchell. And I've been bitching about music from minute one of TNA. I love the Disciples of the New Church theme song. It is a good theme. It's like, you know how you request something off of Fiverr and it's a multitude of things off of Fiverr? You know, you get like you mentioned a couple of weeks ago they request like 20 wrestling themes and you might get two that are really good and the rest are crap. This is one of the two. Yes. It's sad that, you know, this stable, I mean, I guess they last a little while, but this is one of those themes, in my opinion, like the Jack Swagger Real American theme that they should have found a way to keep going for years and years and years. Like, the saddest part was when they broke up and Cesaro got his somewhat of a singles push. 
that they didn't give that music to Cesaro. Um, but anyway, back to 2002. Malice attacks at the bell and drops Ken's throat on the top rope, and then he immediately slaps on a rear chin lock. But what I thought was kind of neat is he steps on the middle rope, lifting Shamrock into the air while doing it. So that was kind of cool. Uh, Ken slaps on the arm bar, but Malice kicks his way out of it. Shamrock trips up the big man and slaps on the ankle lock, but Malice makes it to the ropes. Malice chokes Shamrock on the top rope and goes for a souffle, but the world champ blocks it and hits one of his own. He hits the belly to belly, and Shamrock is still the world champion. Um, I say I thought it was a good match. I think they're doing a great job of making Malice a monster, but not sure I'd beat him clean so soon after beating him clean the first time. The way that it worked, it was like it was one, two, three, kick out. That's how. That's how it looked on screen. So, it wasn't just he was out from the belly to belly. It was more like he was he barely him. beat him. Yeah. Um, I gave it a four point five. You know, better than everything we've seen so far. Even though that's a pretty fucking low bar at this point. Uh, we agree. Four out of ten. Uh, X Division champion AJ Styles versus David Young with Bobcat. And apparently the rules of the X Division are that you can only have a title shot if you lose a match first. As all, <laughs> all four men in last week's title match lost in week one, and David Young lost to Apollo last week. Um, so Bobcat, as I think you noted last week, is a former WWF hardcore champion. So I guess maybe she didn't have to ask sexual favors from uh, Jim Wilson or uh, uh, Bill Barron's. It's like, hey, I'm a champion. I know what it uh, takes to have a champion. So and uh, Bill Barron's is an idiot. So David Young got a title match here. Yeah. Um, going back to what we were mentioning last week, uh, Bobcat was the Godfather's hoe that won the title. Yes. And I'm sure she immediately lost it to Crash Holly. I mean, no, she immediately lost it, but I'm just assuming Crash Holly was the person who she beat slash got beat by. Um, Talk about the match while I look it up. So Young attacks at the bell because everyone has done that tonight, and so far it's worked for nobody. Uh, Styles tries to build a head of steam, but Young just runs him over the shoulder block. AJ does a flip dive over the top rope, but landed a few feet short, so he clotheslined his opponent, which, when it comes to fuck-ups, that, I thought, was a pretty cool fuck-up. Because, yeah, he was going for a dive, but realized he was coming up short, but instead of just ruining the spot, he thought quickly on his feet and clotheslined him. So, was, you know, I liked it. Um, he goes for some kind of springboard move, but Young shoved him, and AJ takes a nasty bump, throwing, him on, throwing himself on the top rope and falling to the floor. Young breaks out an acai moonsault, which, to be honest, before watching these weekly pay-per-views, the only David Young I'd ever seen was doing job after job after job as the diamonds in the rough. So, we feel like Skipper, no less. Yeah. So, like, I was not expecting a high-flying X Division action out of David Young of all people, but fuck, you know. Uh, the story here: Bobcat wasn't even paying attention to the match, and she's posing to the camera. Uh, we had a series of counters in the ring leading to D.Y. sending A.J. upside down in the corner. Young gets a series of near falls after a kick to the head. Um, A.J. hits the Scorpion Death Drop while Bobcat shakes her boobs into the camera. And we get a series of reversals. Young hits an awesome-looking spine buster for a two-count. They built up... The cab driver slam! The cab driver slam! They, they build up Young as having this great spine buster. And it was a nice spine buster. Yeah. And AJ kicks out of two, and Young just doesn't care and just keeps moving on. Uh, the finish, he sets AJ up on the ropes, goes for her Karana, but AJ blocks it and hits an avalanche styles clash for the win. Um, after the match, Bobcat, the manager of the loser of the match, uh, gets in the ring and danced around, so AJ shoved her down and left with the belt. Bobcat didn't seem that upset by it because she just continued to dance while David Young looked perplexed. 
I think this may have been the best match in David Young's entire TNA career. He's here for like five years, and like I can't tell you one other, you know, great David Young match. I gave this a 7.0. It was sloppy at points, but I thought it was still really good. I gave it a 6. Uh, it was like in between the Acai Moonsault and the Spine Buster, there was like nothing there. I, I will say <laughs> AJ Styles, this is his third match. This is his second win. You know, because let's be honest, like nobody really remembered his run at the end of WCW. And even then, I don't think he ever won a match in WCW. He won a match. Okay. Well, fine. They, they moved, him and Air Paris moved on to the second round of the tag title tournament. Did they? I thought they were out in the first round. No, it was the second round. Okay. All right. That's fine. But either way, the Styles clash to a national audience is still a new move. So you just need to, you hit it normally for months. And then when you do the uh, Styles Clash from the middle rope, it's like, holy fuck, he took this great move we've been seeing forever and just made it even better, more exciting. Now it's like his second time he's won a match, he's hitting that move. In fact, last week, oh, I don't remember. I'm sure yeah, he had to beat Jerry Lynn twice. I'm sure he used it at some point, but it's like either way, this is uh, for what it's worth, the second time he's won a match. And... The first time he's won a, a final match with the Styles Clash, and he's already doing it from the middle rope, which I thought was unnecessary. Might have been unnecessary, but it was effective. Yes. Uh, by the way, I have some breaking news here. Goldilocks is actually interviewing somebody. So she's not just walking around aimlessly anymore. And that somebody she's interviewing are the Rainbow Express and Joel Gertner. Uh Joel hits on her while the Express told her to get her hair fixed. And Gertner says that, hey, if there's no opponent, they win the belts by forfeit. And then he forced himself on Goldilocks. So out come the Rainbow Express uh, for the match. And Jeremy Borash announces that the NWA has ruled that the Rainbow Express must have opponents for this final match. So they introduced their opponents, Jerry Lynn and AJ Styles. Now, of course, AJ just wrestled in a match that just ended two minutes ago. And here he is now back for a tag team title match. And I love this. Um, I'm going to end up not loving the AJ Styles, Jerry Lynn tag team, but... I love this for this one night here anyway. And, uh, you know, spoiler, they win. You know, shockingly, AJ and Jerry Lynn uh, get the win here. Um, Lynn hits a reverse DDT. Uh, AJ hits a Hurricanrana. Uh, the four-way breaks out. Lenny does a skull-crushing finale. Um, Lynn hits yep. a pod driver on Lenny. Lynn takes Bruce out of the ring. And AJ hits the spiral tap for the win. And so Don West got his wish last week that Jerry Lynn would also get a title belt. And he's sharing it with AJ. By the way, I, here's what I had at the beginning of this. Story was AJ had wrestled not 50 seconds ago and now has to wrestle a completely different style with a guy who he beat for the title last week and has to go up against AJ's biggest nemesis. Lenny Lane. The gay community. The gay community. <laughs> oh Lord, that I, I'm sure AJ, because you know we've we've all said stupid things in our lives, and that was 20 years ago. So I I would hope that uh, AJ is a more open individual than he was then. You know, but thankfully, if he's not, he's not, hasn't been stupid enough to. Publicly announce it, and uh, how about in 2018 when they had Talking Smack, Brian Danielson outs AJ Styles as a flat earther. See, I, unless I'm forgetting this, and uh, I, I remember it being there at the time. I think it was so much he wasn't a flat earther, but like he was willing to accept arguments and willing to listen to people making that argument, 
And you're like, I guess like I can accept him wanting to be open and, you know, listen to differing points of view. And then three years later, he shows up on Crowder. Okay. I did. I don't remember that at all. All right. But he was bitching about how Gillette was like changing their slogan to the best that anyone could get from Gillette, the best a man can get. And so it was like, woke. Like uh, boo wokeness stuff like that. Some people just have fucking problems. I I guess you can take the boy out of the south, but you can't take the south out of the boy. To be fair, has he left the south? No, he lives in Gainesville, Georgia. Well, I know that's where he's announced, but where does he actually live? That's where he lives. Okay. All right. Uh, by the way, I gave this match a 7.0. Oh, we agree. It's like, I like, I will get to it at the end of the show, but it's like, th- like these, fir- the first hour and the second hour are two completely different wrestling shows. And I, I, I mean, I guess I should probably wait till the end of the show to say this, but it's like, if that's what TNA is, where the first hour is some wacky bullshit, but the last things in your memory is a bunch of really good wrestling with either really good or at least really over wrestlers. It's like, I'll accept that. And I'd watch it, you know? So I, like I said, I'm really, I really enjoyed this last hour of the show. Um, And again, we still have, you know, a little bit to go here. We still have the main event, but it's like, again, it's like two entirely different shows. It's like, you know, Russo wrote two hours of shit, and Jerry Jarrett only had time to fix one hour of it. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm sure there's Russo apologists out there who are like, well, I ain't giving you this all the shit. Maybe Jerry Jarrett wrote two hours of shit, and Russo wrote the stuff you like. Fine, if Russo wrote the stuff that I liked on this show, then credit to Vince Russo. However, knowing Vince Russo's style of writing, I have my doubts. We'll say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, what pussies Harris and Storm were, huh? Shamrock got taken out, and 15 minutes later, he was not only back, but he won his match. Harris and Storm were beaten up over an hour earlier, and they just... I didn't think they appeared for, like, three weeks. They would show back up when they moved to the fairgrounds. Yeah. So in three weeks, when they moved to the fairgrounds, Harrison Storm finally returned from this ass kicking. Um, backstage security people are running around and they finally find Jim Miller slash Jim Wilson, who is tied up with the letters FU painted on his stomach. Contin- consider the fact that this happened during the two minute Monty Brown match. How the fuck did whomever do this do that quickly? And by the way, it works fast, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. And and by the way, this is the end of Jim Miller in in TNA. (laughs) One and done. Yes. Sadly, we still have to deal with Bill Barons for the next three months. Doesn't he turn heel? I have this nightmare of a memory where Bill Barons turns heel at some point. Wait till next week. Okay, maybe it was next week. I don't remember. But okay. So main event, Jeff Jarrett and Kay Crush versus Scott Hall and Brian Christopher, which at the very least is a perfect continuation of two of the primary feuds in the company, two of the primary non-title feuds in the company. Jarrett and Hall have been feuding since the opening segment of the first show, and Brian Christopher took Kay Crush's dislike of NASCAR personally. So it's a nice way to mesh the two storylines, keep it going another week, while not giving too, too much away, right? Well, about that. <laughs> so the baby faces hit the ring and attack at the bell. It hasn't worked for anybody tonight, so why should it work here? 
Um, the four men pair off, and it's a Memphis brawl. It's a Jeff Jarrett match, especially this period of time. And personally, I enjoy the Jeff Jarrett Memphis brawl, the Jeff Jarrett main event wrestling match, you know, at least till we get to the overbooked bullshit that usually permeates the Jeff Jarrett match. But I was always a fan of it, you know. It can be exciting. Uh, Hall throws Jared into a dancer's cage while Christopher and Crush fight into sections that don't have fans in them, which I guess is good because then you're not injuring anybody, but bad because it shows how few people are actually here after you spent all night making it look like there's a lot more people than there really were. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris, uh, they fight back to the ring. Jared, by the way, gets slammed on the announcer's table. Lawler goes for a yeah, Lawler goes for a hip hop drop and misses. Paul hits a choke slam on Crush before being attacked by Jarrett. Uh, Don West wonders if there are any fans left to annoy after the heels have pissed off the country music fans and the NASCAR fans. Well, I guess they can annoy everyone who hates both NASCAR and country music. Um, let's see here. Jarrett, uh, Hall gives an atomic drop to Jarrett who goes running into the referee. And, oh, oh, this was after actually the big thing here. So Hall knocks Jarrett down and reaches for the tag. But Christopher's arguing with Kate Crush in the opposite corner. Hall fights back again. Uh, Hall, Hall fights back against Crush, and Jarrett cuts him off before making the tag. Hall clotheslines Jarrett and reaches out for the tag. But it's a swerve, and Christopher turns on Scott Hall. Uh, by the way, yeah, I am interchangeably going from Brian Christopher to Brian Lawler, because that's what the announcers are doing, too. And I don't, nobody can figure out what the hell his damn name is at this point. Um, and as I said before, before I jumped ahead in the report, Paul gives an atomic drop to Jared, who goes uh, running into the referee. Paul now has to beat on all three men by himself. He hits the outsider's edge on Crush. He goes for a second one on Jared, but Christopher breaks it up. He is fucking exhausted. Scott Hall is fucking exhausted at this point. Um, He had trouble with K-Crush. He had trouble with Jarrett. Uh, Jarrett hits the stroke. Christopher hits the hip-hop drop to give himself the loser's share of the purse. As Hall, uh, as uh, Jeff Jarrett gets the pin, and Jarrett and K-Crush pick up the big tag team win. So what's the point of teaming with Hall and fighting on his side for 12 or 13 minutes just to turn him in the end. Legitimately, there was no reason for this heel turn. It came out of nowhere. And the best excuse you could come up with is that Jared, or I'm sorry, Christopher makes for a better heel than a face. And if that's the case, why book him as a face in the first place? And this is what I was saying about the Jeff Jarrett main event match. It's like, you know, I enjoy the first nine, 10 minutes of a Jeff Jarrett main event match. And then the finish is usually overbooked and convoluted. And sure enough, Here's the overbooked, convoluted Jeff Jarrett match main event finish. Um, so yeah, Jarrett and Crush win. I still gave it a four point five out of ten. I uh, let's see. Here. I gave it a four. Um, I had uh, Brian Christopher turns on Scott Hall, ref bump Scott Hall takes on all three of them, but the numbers game was too much. Stroke, leg drop, lull TNA. Uh, show ends with Scott Hall being uncomfortably beat down for the last three minutes. Okay, I, I was reading what I wrote. Four, four um, out of ten. Uh, Jared gets on the mic, says Hall's and worth his shit. He beat him in 95, 97, 2000, and will single-handedly run him out of the NWA. Jared yells at Tanae and then breaks the big-ass trophy that TNA was given earlier. Um, the Tennessee Titans were there, and they run to the guardrail, and I thought, oh my god, this is the moment. But no, it's not the moment. Um... They just yell at Jared while the EMTs load Hall in the stretcher. Jared vows to never be screwed again. Um, and Tanae, Don, and Ed ran down what we will see next week. Uh, Shamrock versus Amore, a six-way rankings match, and the return of the flying Elvis impersonators. Yeah! Um, so, forward to that. so that brings us to the end of the show, and as we do every week we uh average out our ratings for match quality i have it as an average of a 3.44 
I don't know if you averaged yours, but I imagine because we had very similar ratings most of the time, you're probably in that same range. I did a little bit differently. Um, how much did I enjoy the show overall? Okay, that that's the next thing. It's the overall enjoyment, which doesn't always have to be what match quality is. You can have bad matches and enjoy the show. You can have great matches and not enjoy the show for whatever reason. It's however you feel about the show as a whole. I gave it a 5.5. As I mentioned, it's a story of two TNAs. The first hour of the show was full of everything they need to avoid doing, and the second hour was full of everything they mostly need to do more of. Um, honestly, got uh, five out of five out of ten for me. I, I thought it was a decent show. And then the likelihood to buy the show again based on this show, because remember these are weekly pay per views. They're asking you to pay ten dollars every single week. So based on this show, how likely are you to buy next week's show? I gave that a five. Again, as long as we get more of the good and a lot less of the bad. I'm excited to keep watching. I would say, yeah, roughly the same. So averaging it out, I have an overall rating of a 4.65, which considering how much I like the second half of the show is kind of surprising it's that low. But again, first half of the show sucked. Mm -hmm. Sucked many dicks and not any good way. Because, yes, there are good ways to suck dicks, and this show is not one of them. No, the dicks were wrestling uh, in the tag team division at the time for WWE. Maybe. Oh, my God. It, it took me a second. I'm like, what are you talking about? The dicks were on this show losing in the uh, opener. I'm like, oh, my God, you're talking about the dicks. <laughs> but, uh, the Tolans. Uh, J- what, was, what was it? Chad and James Dick. Yeah. Remember the Jim and I ended up getting first names? If they, only. They did. It was like Jake and Jesse or Jerry or something. Yeah. And the funny thing is, you know, TNA is going to bring in a wrestler who, you know, is decently well known named Michael Shane. And he got a legal letter from WWE because when they signed the Johnsons, the Shane twins, one of their names is Mike Shane. So they sent Michael Shane a cease and desist letter saying that they, that he needs to stop using that name, which is why he became Matt Bentley. And then WWE didn't even use the fucking name to begin with. (laughs) Who the fuck is he? Matt Bentley or Michael Shane? Same. Anyway. Oh, I, I thought you were... <laughs> I, no, no, you were I, was, I was doing an OSW reference where B1 would go, Matt Bentley, who the fuck is he? And we're asking... All, of us are, all he had was that stupid bounce dance with Tracy Brooks uh, in early Impact he era TNA. I, I mean, if you want a... You know, lousy excuse to make Tracy Brooks, you know, jiggle up and down. I guess there's worse things you could have done. Mm -hmm. Um, But so that's going to do it for this week's uh, TNA report. Um, Anything you want to plug before we finish things up? Uh, Yeah. um, A couple of weeks ago, I actually took advice from Aria um, on my Facebook page. Asked for a year for best, worst, and blandest game show. Aria suggested 1991. I thank you for avoiding 1990. That's a, a different big kettle of fish I'm trying to tackle at the end of the year. So, on my uh, YouTube channel, Game Show Gumbo, look for best, worst, and blandest of 1991. And you'll See that it was Arya's inspiration. I'll be honest; I have legitimately no I, no idea why I would have said 1991. Well, you did. Um. So since it's uh since since uh, this show is dropping July third, uh, can you predict what you're doing in the future? Uh, probably releasing a home game on Wheel of Fortune for the N64. Nice. 
So what are your thoughts on Ryan Seacrest being the new host of the Wheel of Fortune? He'll be fine. Um, they already recorded four weeks worth, and they're redesigning. They had to move uh, studios. Now, did they... I'll, I'll be honest, like, I, and I, I used to watch Wheel of Fortune all the time with my grandmother, who passed away in 04, and I never really watched it again after that. Did they really... Was it ever, like, a deal that we're looking for Pat Sajak's replacement. Like our, when Alex Trebek died, you know, it was a months long thing. It's like, I just like, okay, Pat Sajak retired on Friday and on Monday, here's uh fucking uh, Ryan Seacrest as the new host. Like, oh, okay. It was announced very early. When Pat announced his retirement, they looked for a host immediately and they saw Ryan Seacrest as the safe choice and the smart choice because the Jeopardy host search was a disaster. It's funny because it's like Mike Richards got a lot of shit. And of course, you know, for many reasons, he got pulled. And I'm not even saying he shouldn't have been pulled, but he got a lot of shit for naming himself host. But if you remember when he did the, when he was the fill in host for that week or however long he was there, he was really good, I thought. He was fine. Um, he actually didn't name himself host. It well, was that, that was the heads the of Sony. That you know, it, he's the executive producer, and he named and he quote unquote named himself the host. Right. And there's this whole kerfuffle that happened, and they found uh, old episodes of his podcast where uh, he said some unflattering things, and so he aired after a week of him being the official host, he got booted for Mayim Bialik. I, I love Mayim Bialik. I, I can't say I watch a lot of Jeopardy these days, but I just love her in general. Um, The reason she got fired was because of the strikes that happened. She got fired? I thought she was still hosting the like when they do the tournaments or the prime time nope. Jeopardy. Really? Yeah, she's gone. Um, Ken's now the host for everything. Shows you how much I pay attention. People are going to start wondering what I actually pay attention to because I, I've been on other shows talking about how I don't pay attention to modern wrestling much anymore. So I can't really talk about that. I'm not paying attention to what's going on on game shows. I'm not paying attention to really much of anything. Hey, it, Pretty much, here's here's the list of everything I apparently am paying attention to. Classic wrestling. And, hey, that's good enough for me, right? Yep. But that's going to do it for this week. I want to thank everybody for listening. And we're going to press the stop button and then press the record button again to record next week's show. So, hope you all enjoyed it. Leave some feedback. Subscribe. Five-star reviews. Thumbs up. All the good, happy shit. Because, hey, we may not have the greatest audience in the world, but... You know, the people who listen seem to enjoy this shit. So thank you. But thank everybody for listening. And we'll talk to you again in seven days.